Hello, everybody, and welcome to Artists in Residence. Um, this is a series of virtual visits with Moore College of Art and Design's recent graduates, um, the class of 2020. My name is Leah Komiski, and I'm the Education and Public Engagement Coordinator for the galleries at Moore. And I am joined by Kiara Riley, who is uh, the gallery's graduate assistant. And we're visiting with Olive Hayes, um, who has recently received her BFA in art education. Some of you may know Olive as Brianna Hayes. Um, Olive is a painter and educator based out of Philadelphia. She's exhibited at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the Community College of Allegheny County in Pittsburgh. She was the 2019 recipient of Moore's Fanny Brennan Scholarship for Excellence in Painting, as well as the most recent recipient of the Deborah Deary Memorial Award for Excellence in Art Education. Olive is looking forward to attending the Rome Art Program in Italy in June of 2021. So thank you both for being here today. I'm excited to talk with you. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to start um, the conversation like we have um, been starting all of our conversations in this series um, by saying that, you know, again, the, the sort of impetus behind this program is really first and foremost to check in with our recent graduates. Um, you've all just sort of recently wrapped up um, your final semesters delivering some really incredible thesis work amid extremely um, difficult and challenging circumstances. Um, COVID-19, of course, and you know, we find ourselves in the midst of um, a lot of civil unrest and um, you know, our community is, uh, is grieving the loss of more black lives at the hands of police. Um, so, you know, the first question that I want to ask you is, how are you doing? <laughs> well, I've been doing pretty well. Um, I'm just kind of going day by day, really, just trying to figure out what's going to go on for the next year. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of going day by day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we can start um, by taking like a little bit of a closer look at your thesis project. Um, so I'll share my screen so that um, everybody at home can get a sense of what your work is all about. All right. Um, so these are some images that um, that Olive took of her own work. Um, and um, just scan through here. So this is a series of large scale nudes. Um, some really beautiful color. So, I want to start by asking you, I mean, you're obviously this work um, is, is looking at um, historical conventions of the female nude um, as a starting point. Um, it seems that you're very critical of that. Um, so why was that something that you felt that you wanted to take on um, with your thesis project? So, um a lot of my thesis builds off of impressionism, impressionism and post-impressionism um, specifically. And these are two movements that I kind of looked through a lot during my high school education, during my college education. It was in a lot of my art history classes, as well as being in Philadelphia, being near the barns and the PMA. They're just really prevalent in a lot of um, you know, American uh, museums and institutions. And learning about these and especially um, this kind of cliche that comes up of like the nature nude or these really random scenes of um, just nude people in nature um, pop up a lot. And I found these almost comedic because they're portrayed and displayed in very like modest institutions. Um, even though they're nude, there's kind of like a perceived modesty about them people don't necessarily view them as a sexual painting, even if that may have been the intention or the experience of the painter. So something that I'm really interested in is taking that perceived modesty and kind of unveiling it, taking it away 
and almost replicating and building off of these uh, nature nude paintings that I've seen in um, you know different art history classes and expanding upon them and exaggerating the sexual qualities of them. So do you think, does, does nudity signify something um, different in, for instance, um, impressionist painting, post-impressionist painting? Does that signify something in particular that your, um, that your work does not? The, the kind of funny thing about it is that I feel like I'm doing a lot of the similar things that they are doing. I'm not necessarily rejecting um, the sexuality that is in those paintings, but more or less I'm rejecting that perceived sense of modesty and um, kind of questioning where, you know, where certain paintings can be placed and who can view them and like kind of what, what perception people get from them. Um, so whenever, you know, the post-impressionist and impressionist painted um, these nude, uh, nature nudes, I'm not necessarily um, critiquing the fact that they did that, but more so critiquing the quality in which they did it. And, you know, again, I find it, I kind of find it funny that, that this very sexualized um, practice has happened and yet it's still become a very serious thing, I guess, in art history. I think, I mean, I definitely, I pick up on some humor with your work too. Like these figures, I mean, they're the, like balloon animals almost, <laughs> like super exaggerated, like kind of like cartoonish forms. Um, is that something um, you were hoping your viewers would perceive? Is there supposed to be an element of sort of comedy in, in their representation? Absolutely, and that, and that actually took me a while to get to that point. So whenever I started painting um, figures, I initially kind of focused on very specific points of the body that I could exaggerate. So for example, whenever I started out painting, I would make hands very enlarged and feet and um, make the face very, you know, discolored. And I've kind of grown off of that over the course of my college experience. And it's kind of reached a point where the people who I depict are so strange that they aren't necessarily people anymore. They do look like like balloon animals almost. And that I really did kind of want to take these um, these people to a completely different level. Uh, and a part of that goes a little bit into the criticism behind these um, impressionist and post-impressionist paintings in that whenever we see the nature nude, at least in my opinion, I believe that the landscaped aspect of it and these figures being in kind of a nature space is kind of a veil, like an excuse to paint naked people. And so I also believe that because of that, there's a little bit of a taking away from their humanity. Um, typically these are large groups of people, usually large groups of um, the female body, and there's not really a sense of identity there. It's more so an excuse for typically a male painter to you know, get that kind of satisfaction of painting a nude person in front of them. And so with my figures, I am exaggerating them to a point where they do not look real um, to kind of build off of that idea. Do you have, um, can you like point to any um, impressionist or post-impressionist painters that deal in this subject? Um, to one that um, you particularly enjoy as a viewer? Yeah, one of the most, I guess, inspirational paintings for me in this line of work would be um, Cezanne's The Large Basers. That's a piece that I looked at a lot, um, both in person and um, digitally. And kind of, again, this builds off of that idea of the exaggerated body. So mm -hmm. in The Large Basers, we see these kind of humanoid figures that are extremely elongated and their bodies are in like this kind of crude blocky manner. Their faces aren't recognizable. And again, it's kind of an excuse to take the body and kind of warp it into this idealized stylized form that isn't necessarily human, but it does represent sexuality and the nude body. I could definitely see that. That's yeah. interesting that, um 
that you're drawn to those works. Um, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the, the process of finishing? I know it probably seems like ages ago, um, but the process of finishing um, this large scale series of works um, off campus um, when we had to make that move because of COVID-19, um, were you able to sort of carve out a studio space um, where you were located? Um, and, and what was that process like for you? Were there any challenges? Yeah, I would say first and foremost, um, my biggest challenge was transportation. Um, I live in South Philly, but I rely completely on public transit. So mm -hmm. not being able to take those large paintings onto a bus was definitely really stressful for me. And um, <laughs> thankfully my, uh, my roommates mom actually offered to mm -hmm. transport them which was a huge relief because I was like at the point of like walking an hour multiple times carrying these panels yeah. to the house yeah. <laughs> um, so that was that was my first kind of feat mm -hmm. and um once we get the paintings into the house so, uh, space was a little bit of an issue for me I wasn't exactly sure, you know, where I could go, but thankfully my roommates came in and helped me again. Um, they let me use the dining room space, which was really helpful. I just kind of cleared the dining room out and um, used those walls. Now, there was one thing where I did have an eight foot long panel that I was initially going to have be like my large thesis piece, but because of space, I, I could not pursue that anymore. Um, I do have it in storage. And I'm going to readdress it at some point whenever I am able to. Um, so my work had to scale down. And instead of doing one really large piece, I did two semi-smaller pieces. And then um, my last challenge would be documentation. I think that was definitely the hardest part for me. Um, my The place where I live isn't <laughs> the most well lit. Um, I don't really have that much access to um, one space and clean walls but also um to good lighting and i also don't own you know a, a good camera <laughs> so i kind of had to make do on what on what i had there and thankfully um you know having access to photoshop through more was a huge help but i think just kind of having to play with what resources i had was really difficult but also kind of enlightening and it made me feel good that I could do I could do it without having um, all the equipment that I want to have one day um, so it was it was a good and a bad thing I actually had a question for you about documentation that photo where you're like prepping pop, popping the painting on top of like two paint cans was really cool to me and that it like really illuminated the kind of moment we're in of like kind of DIY things you have to do. What other like issues or like complications with space, especially as a person who works so large, like how did you have to like have any weird adjustments with like space and like moving a kitchen table? Was it like anything like that? Or was it a pretty smooth spatial transition? Well, it was definitely, I had to move the table. Um, but again, going back on lighting, I don't have any large lamps and um, the light in the dining room does not work. So I was kind of working off of different small spotlights and I would have to work at one area at a time, which was a big adjustment for me because usually working large scale gives you the freedom to kind of get up and walk to different sides of the painting and repeatedly like work on different areas and be able to take a step back and view the whole thing at once. But I was kind of in a situation where I had to view small pieces at once. And that was really tricky for me. I can imagine so, yeah. <laughs> did you, like, on the flip side of that question, did you encounter any sort of um, opportunities um, during this time as a result of unusual circumstances? Um, I guess the opportunities in that I, as soon as I was done with my thesis, I started working small scale, which is something that I don't typically do. I don't typically like doing, but it's definitely opening up doors because I can finish them a lot faster. So I feel good in the sense that even though my thesis is done, I'm still actively making work and that I can get it done pretty fast. So I feel like I'm building up my portfolio a lot faster than I did whenever I was in school. So it did kind of force me to go into this direction that has ended up helping me. 
has um have you been feeling um very invested in your art making right now or you know as a result of everything that is happening in the world um we are in a time of crisis um have you felt um that are, are you devoting your energy towards art making or are there other sort of um activist pursuits that you are um engaging in so i feel like right now it's my responsibility to kind of take a step back from my art making process especially um take a step back from posting about it. Um, I've been really trying to merge all my social media um, less as a platform for my art during this time and more so as a platform for information sharing as much as I can and just kind of my silence in my own artwork and focusing on me. So I haven't been focusing on my art as much and I've been focusing a lot more on information sharing. Um, so that's kind of been at the point that I have been at. On the same like vein as that, are there any like artists slash activist folks that you've been like looking at, especially in this moment? And I've been looking everywhere, but I've, I mean, yeah, not nothing that comes quite to mind, but I have been really impressed by a lot of the responses of the artists that I do follow. Um, I've been noticing a lot of people donating work and mm -hmm. um, having auctions of their work to, you know, get um, donation money to different charities, which I've been really appreciating. Um, are there any activist artists that you've been following? Oh, I didn't expect to get the question back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, lots of folks. Um, I look to Erica Hart a lot, who's like a sex therapist, but not really a artist, but like is creative in many ways, but like, I think they do a lot of interesting work around like um, pleasure and art and, you know, oppression, which is like an interesting stack on top of one another, but like they have a really cool Instagram and they're just like funny too. So thank you. Are you both finding a question for you both? Are you, are you finding um, the, um, the, you know, activists and artists that you are, um, encountering and interested in, is that primarily through social media channels or are there other ways that you're getting that information right now? Hmm. I think it's like interesting to go outside sometimes. And like, I've seen lots of murals yeah. with like, <laughs> like mask up or like wash your hands. And I'm like, oh, this is really like strangely dystopian, but also like really amazing to go outside and be able to see like, art that responds to this moment, but I think I mostly utilize like Instagram and Twitter for that kind of content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to agree. It's definitely mostly um, social media for me and also keeping up with different, um, you know, like art publications as well. So are you sort of plotting anything for the future right now or is is the future just on hold for the moment? Um, what's happening in your world? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. So I am plotting for the future. Um, I do want to get my master's soon. Um, I've been told by many people to hold off. So I'm going to hold off as long as I can. But um, I do want to enter my master's program within the next few years. And um, I hope to get an MFA in either studio art or painting. Um, the reason why I want to do that mostly not only is for, I really want to learn how to talk about my art better and um, kind of explore, you know, critical dialogue. But I also really want to be able to teach um, at a collegiate level or work in a collegiate um, type setting. So that's why I really want to get a master's. And um, additionally, some, I guess, more recent news is that I, um, I got an internship at Summertime Gallery, which is in Brooklyn. Um, mm -hmm. I'm doing that all remotely. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, can, you tell, can you talk a little bit about Summertime Gallery for anyone that might not be super familiar with what they do? Absolutely. So Summertime is a Brooklyn-based gallery, and um, they, their huge focus is kind of taking away um, the elitist uh, qualities of the art market and the art world by um, representing artists with intellectual disabilities alongside artists who do not have intellectual disabilities. 
So what will your role as an intern be? And will it be remote, I guess, or? Yep, it's all remote. Yeah. Um, and right now I'm doing a little, a little bit of different things. Um, I am working with their publication, which is called The Double Scoop, um, you know, helping with formatting that, helping with, um, you know, talking to different people. And a lot of it, I believe, um, I just kind of got into this position, so I'm still kind of learning what I'll be doing. Um, but I will also be kind of talking with some of their artists. I will be working with a program um, that they are going to be hosting called Matchmaker Matchmaker, which is kind of an artist like connection building type um, program where artists can match up with other artists and um, have dialogue together. So it's really, I'm really excited about it. I'm excited to learn more about my position, but it's something that's very new for me. Yeah, that's really exciting. Congratulations. Yeah, that's really cool. Since you're doing this all like virtually, as you're also like an art education person, like what do you think is the future of like art ed in this like very virtual programming world? <laughs> it's exciting. I, I think that because people have been forced to move online recently, um, it's kind of, it's forcing them to be a little bit more accessible. I believe that you know, obviously having a computer is accessible for a lot of different people um, because technology can be, you know, very supplemental in a lot of ways. And it can also allow people to, from anywhere, to kind of come in, no matter where that that gallery or that program is based. So I'm really excited about it. I think that because places have been forced to go online, I'm hoping that it's something that is continued because I believe that a lot of places are really realizing how how lucrative it is and how well people respond to it. Yeah, I agree. And do you think that, um, you, I, I guess you've expressed the, the interest in teaching it in like higher education down the road. Do you anticipate that you will um, continue in some capacity of our education until you get to that point? Yeah, I, I love working with um, people of all ages. I would love to actually get some kind of position in an elementary school um, up until I get to that point. I love working with kids um, in addition to working with adults. So it's definitely something that I'm going to continue pursuing, um, even though my, my end goal is to be able to work in a college. Do you want to stay in Philly? Or are you open to other? <laughs> <laughs> I want to stay in Philadelphia. Um, I would like to get my master's in Philadelphia, but it might take me somewhere else. I'm not opposed to moving. But right now, I, I really enjoy living in Philly, and I would like to stay here. Um, so I guess I have just like one last question for you. Um, and we've, we've touched on it a little bit, um, but not super directly. So I just want to know what your opinion is, you know, what is the role of art making and art education, um, in, in times of crisis? So I guess art making and, um, just art education in general, I found it to be really helpful during this period, um, especially during the pandemic in that. One, it allows, you know, an outlet for many people. I started to notice, you know, people who I know who were never interested in art start taking up an art uh, practice during this time. And so in one area, I think that it allows people to kind of explore themselves and express themselves and have fun whenever there are really challenging periods happening. But in another way, I believe that artists in the art market um, are kind of taking the lead on a lot of, um, you know, activism and um, fighting for justice in these situations. Um, I see just a lot of crossover in that and artists, you know, and I'm trying to think of some specifics, but even like, if we're talking a little bit about Philadelphia, and um, how there are proposed budget cuts to um, the Office of Arts and Culture. I've seen a lot of people fighting for that, also fighting for 
redistribution into the other areas that have been cut. So like public health and um, libraries and all of that and um, fighting for, you know, the defunding of the police and taking away a lot of that money and redistributing it into the other areas. So I believe that just art in general and people who are making art have been huge leaders in in um, fighting not only for the arts, but for the other outlets that have been affected by the pandemic um, and by what the pandemic has, you know, been done to the economy and how cities are responding to that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think, I mean, some of the most interesting and accomplished artists are those that are directly involved in, in that activism. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see that that's sort of where you're headed. I mean, it's definitely where you're headed. So I very much look forward to seeing where you end up. Um, you know, thank you so much for, for inviting us into your home today, um, talking a little bit about what this experience has been like for you. Um, it was really great to learn more about your work and your vision. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.